That's such an exciting future, by the way. It's a bit of a tangent, but like to allow a model to change files. It's scary for people, but like it's really cool to be able to just like let the agent do a, a set of tasks and you come back the next day and kind of observe like it's a colleague or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think there may be different versions of like runnability where for the simple things where you're doing things in the span of a few minutes on behalf of the user as they're programming, it makes sense to make something work locally in their machine. I think for the more aggressive things where you're making larger changes that take longer periods of time, you'll probably want to do this in some sandbox remote environment. And that's another incredibly tricky problem of how do you exactly reproduce or mostly reproduce to the point of it being effectively equivalent for running code, the user's environment with this remote re remote sandbox. I'm curious what kind of agents you want for, for coding. <laughs> oh, for Did co you, do you want them to find bugs? Do you want them to like implement new features? Like what, what agents do you want? So by the way, when I think about agents, I don't think just about coding. Uh, I think so for the practices to this particular podcast, there's video editing. And a lot of, if you look in Adobe, a lot of there's code behind, uh, it's very poorly documented code, but you can interact with Premiere, for example, using code. And uh, basically all the uploading, everything I do on YouTube, everything as you could probably imagine, I do all of that through code. And, so, and including translation and overdubbing all of this. So, I envision all those kinds of tasks. So automating many of the tasks that don't have to do directly with the editing. So that, okay. That's what I was thinking about. But in terms of coding, I would be th fundamentally thinking about bug finding. Like many levels of kind of bu bug finding and also bug finding like logical bugs, not logical, like spiritual bugs or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, ones like sort of big directions of implementation, that kind of stuff. Let's opine on bug finding. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting that these models are so bad at bug finding uh, when just naively prompted to find a bug. They're incredibly poorly calibrated. Even the, the smartest model. Exactly, mm -hmm. even, yeah. o, even O1. How do you explain that? Is there a good intuition? I think these models are a really strong reflection of the pre-training distribution. And you know, I do think they, they generalize as the loss gets lower and lower, but I don't think the, the, the loss and the scale is quite, or the loss is low enough such that they're like really fully generalizing in code. Like the things that we use these things for, uh, the frontier models that that they're quite good at are really code generation and question answering. And these things exist in massive quantities in pre-training with all of the code on GitHub on the scale of many, many trillions of tokens and questions and answers on things like Stack Overflow and maybe GitHub issues. And so when you try to push into these things that really don't exist uh, very much online, like for example, the cursor tap objective of predicting the next edit, given the edits done so far. Uh, the brittleness kind of shows. And then bug detection is another great example where there aren't really that many examples of like actually detecting real bugs and then proposing fixes. Um, and the models just kind of like really struggle at it. But I think it, it's a question of transferring the model, like in the same way that you get this fantastic transfer um, from pre-trained models uh, just on code in general to the cursor tab objective. Uh, you'll see a very, very similar thing with generalized models that are really good at code to bug detection. It just takes like a little bit of kind of nudging in that direction. Like to be clear, I think they sort of understand code really well. Like while they're being pre-trained, like the representation that's being built up, like almost certainly like you know, somewhere in the stream, there's the model knows that maybe there's there's some ske something sketchy going on, right? It sort of has some sketchiness, but actually eliciting the, the sketchiness to uh, feel like actually like part part of it is that humans are really calibrated on which bugs are really important. Mm, it's not just yeah, actually yeah. it's not just actually saying like there's something sketchy. It's like it's just it's just it's sketchy trivial. It's the sketchy like you're gonna take the server down. It's yeah, just like yeah. like part of it is maybe the cultural knowledge of uh, like well, why is a staff engineer a staff engineer? A staff engineer is is good because they know that three years ago, like someone wrote a really you know sketchy piece of code that took took the server down, and as opposed <laughs> to like as opposed to maybe there's like you know you just this thing is like 
an experiment. So like a few bugs are fine. Like you're just trying to experiment and get the feel of the thing. And so if the model gets really annoying when you're writing an experiment, that's really bad. But if you're writing something for you know, super production, you're like writing a database, right? You're, you're writing code in Postgres or Linux or whatever. Like you're Linus Torvalds. You're, you're, it's sort of unacceptable to have even an edge case. And just, just having the calibration of like, how paranoid is the user? Like, But yeah. even then, like if you're putting in a maximum paranoia, it still just like doesn't quite get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, but this is hard for humans too to understand what which line of code is important and which is not. It's like you, I think one of your principles on a website says if 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 a code can do a lot of damage, one should add a comment that say this 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 line of code is is dangerous. And uh, uh, all caps, uh, all repeated caps. <laughs> ten times. <laughs> ten, uh, no, and you say like. For every single line yes. of code inside the function, you have to, uh, and it, that's quite profound. That says something about human beings because the it's, the engineers move on. Even the same person might just forget how it can sink the Titanic, a single function. Like you don't, yeah, you, it, you might not intuit that quite clearly by yeah. looking at the single piece of code. Yeah, and I think that that one is also uh, partially also for today's AI models where. Uh, if you actually write dangerous, dangerous, dangerous in every single line, like uh, the models will pay more attention to that and will <laughs> be more likely to find bugs in that region. That's actually just straight up a really good practice of labeling code of how much damage this can do. Yeah, I mean, it's controversial. <laughs> like, it, it, some people think it's ugly. Uh, Swallow well, I, I actually think like it's, it, it's but... uh, like, in <laughs> fact, I, I actually think this is one of the things I learned from Arvid is, you know, like, I uh, sort of aesthetically, I don't like it, but mm -hmm. I think there's certainly something where, like, it's it's useful for the models and, and humans just forget a lot. And it's really easy to make a small mistake and cause, like, bring down, you know, like, just bring down the server and, and like, 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 of course, we, t we, like, test a lot and whatever, but... There, there's always these things that you have to be very careful. Yeah, like with just normal doc strings, I think people will often just skim it when making a change and think, oh, this, I, I know how to do this. Um, and you kind of really need to point it out to them so that that doesn't slip through. Yeah, you have to be reminded that you could do a lot of damage. That's like, we don't really think about that. Like, yeah. You think about, okay, how do I figure out how this works so I can improve it? You don't think about the other direction. That yeah. could do this until a, until we have formal verification for everything, then you can do whatever you want, and you you know for certain that you have not introduced a bug if the proof passes. But concretely, what do you think that future would look like? I think uh, people will just not write tests anymore, and um, the model will suggest like you write a function, the model will suggest a spec, and you review the spec, and uh, in the meantime. A uh, smart reasoning model computes a proof that the implementation follows the spec, um, and I think that happens for for most functions. Yeah. Don't you think this gets at a little bit some of the stuff you were talking about earlier with the difficulty of specifying intent for what you want with software, um, uh, where sometimes it might be because the intent is really hard to specify. It's also then going to be really hard to prove that it's actually matching whatever your intent is. Like you think that spec is hard to generate? Yeah, or just like for a given spec maybe you can i think there is a question of like can you actually do the formal verification like that's like is that possible i think that there's like more to dig into there but then also even if you have the spec if you have the spec but how do you even if you have the spec, the spec is, it, is the spec written in natural language yeah how do you map the spec no the, 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 the spec spec would be formal but how easy okay. would that be so then wrong? i think that you care about things that are not going to be easily well specified in the spec language i see i see would yeah be, um yeah maybe uh an argument against formal verification is all you need yeah. yeah, the worry but, is there's this massive document. replacing replacing I, I, something like yeah. unit tests. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you can probably also evolve the the spec languages to capture some of the things that they don't really capture right now. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's very exciting. And you're speaking not just about like single functions. You're speaking about entire code bases. I think entire code bases is harder, but that that is what I would love to have. And I think. It should be possible, and because you can even there, there's like a lot of work recently where uh, you can prove formally verify down to the hardware. So like through the you formally verify the C code, and then you formally verify through the GCC compiler, and then through the Verilog down to the hardware. Um, 
And that's like an incredibly big system, but it actually works. And I think big code bases are, are sort of similar in that they're like multi-layered system. And um, if you can com- decompose it and formally verify each part, then I think it should be possible. I think the specification problem is a real problem, but... How do you handle side effects? Or how do you handle, I guess, external dependencies, like calling the Stripe API? Maybe Stripe would write a spec for the API. But like, API. you can't do this for everything. Like, can you do this for everything you use? Like, how do you how do you do it for if there's a language model? Like, maybe maybe like people will use language models as primitives in the programs mm-hmm, they write, mm-hmm. and there's like a dependence on it. And like, how how do you now include that? I think you might be able to prove prove that still. Prove what about language models? I think if it, it feels possible that you could actually prove that a language model is aligned, for example. Hmm. Or like you can prove that it actually gives the the right answer. Um, that's the dream. Yeah, that is. I mean, that's yeah. if it's possible. That's your, I have a dream speech. If it's possible, <laughs> that, that will certainly help with, you know, uh, making sure your code doesn't have bugs and making sure AI doesn't destroy all of human civilization. So the, yeah. the full spectrum of AI safety to just bug finding. Uh, what you, so you said the models struggle with bug finding. What's the hope? You know, my hope initially is, uh, and and I can let Michael Michael chime in too. But it's like this: um, it should you know first help with the stupid bugs. Like it should very quickly catch the stupid bugs. Like off by one errors. Like sometimes you write something in a comment and do it the other way. It's like very common. Like I do this. I write like less than in a comment and like I maybe write the greater than sign or something like that. And the model is like, yeah, it looks sketchy. Like, do you sure you want to do that? Uh, but eventually it should be able to catch harder bugs too. Yeah, and I think that it's also important to note that this is having good bug finding models feels necessary to get to the highest reaches of having AI do more and more programming for you, where you're going to, you know, if the AI is building more and more of the system for you, you need to not just generate, but also verify. And without that, some of the problems that we've talked about before with programming with these models um, will just become untenable. Um, So it's not just for humans, like you write a bug, I write a bug, find the bug for me, but it's also being able to to verify the AI's code and check it um, is really important. Yeah. And then how do you actually do this? Like we have had a lot of contentious dinner discussions of how do you actually clean a bug model? But one very popular idea is, you know, it's kind of potentially easy to introduce a bug than actually finding the bug. And so you can train a model to introduce bugs in existing code, um, and then you can train a reverse bug model then that uh, can find find bugs using this synthetic data. So that's like one example. Uh, but yeah, there are lots of ideas for how to. You can also um, you can also do a bunch of work not even at the model level of taking the biggest models and then maybe giving them access to a lot of information that's not just the code. Like it's kind of a hard problem to like stare at a file and be like, where's the bug? And you know that's that's hard for humans often, right? And so often you have to to run the code and being able to see things like traces and step through a debugger. Um, there's another whole another direction where it like kind of tends toward that. And it could also be that there are kind of two different product form factors here. It could be that you have a really specialty model that's quite fast that's kind of running in the background and trying to spot bugs. And it might be that sometimes, sort of to Arvid's earlier example about you know some nefarious input box bug, it might be that sometimes you want to like. There's, you know there's a bug, you're not just like checking hypothesis free, you're like, this is a problem, I really wanna solve it. And you zap that with tons and tons and tons of compute and you're willing to put in like $50 to solve that bug or something even more. Have you thought about integrating money into this whole thing? Like I would pay probably a large amount of money for if you found a bug or even generated code that I really appreciated. Like I had a moment a, a few days ago when I started using cursor where it generated a perfect, <laughs> Uh, like perfect three functions for interacting with the YouTube API to update captions and uh, for localization, like different in different languages. The API documentation is not very good. And the code across, like if I, I Googled it for a while, I couldn't find exactly, there's a lot of confusing information and cursor generated perfectly. And I was like, I just sat back, I read the code. I was like, this is correct. I tested it, it's correct. I was like, I want to tip. <laughs> on a on a button that goes, yeah. <laughs> here's five dollars. One that's really good just to support the company and support what the the interface is, and the other is that probably sends a strong signal, like good job, <laughs> <laughs> right? So there's, there's a much stronger signal than just accepting the code, right? You yeah. just actually send like a strong good job. That and for bug finding, obviously, like 
Yep. There's a lot of people, you know, that would pay a huge amount of money for a bug, like a bug bug bounty thing, right? Is that you guys think about that? Yeah, it's a controversial idea inside the the company. I think it sort of depends on how much uh, you believe in humanity, almost. You know, <laughs> like uh, I think it would be really cool if like uh, you spend nothing to try to find a bug, and if it doesn't find a bug, you you spend zero dollars, and then if it does find a bug. Uh, and you click accept, then it also shows like in parentheses, like $1. And so you spend $1 to accept the bug. Uh, and then of course there's a worry like, okay, we spent a lot of computation. Like maybe people will just copy paste. Um, I think that's a worry. Um, and then there is also the worry that like introducing money into the product makes it like kind of, you know, like it doesn't feel as fun anymore. Like you have to like think about money and and you all you want to think about is like the code. Uh, and so maybe it actually makes more sense to separate it out and like you pay some fee like every month and then you get all of these things for free. But there could be a tipping component, which is not like it, it yes, costs Yes, but it still this. has that like dollar symbol. I think it's fine, but I, I also see the point where like maybe you don't want to introduce it. Yeah, I was going to say the moment that feels like people do this is when they share it, when they have this right. fantastic example, they just kind of share it with their friends. There is also a potential world where there's a technical solution to this, like on our system problem too, where if we can get to a place where we understand the output of the system more, I mean, to the stuff we were talking about with like, you know, error checking with the LSP and then also running the code. But if you could get to a place where you could actually somehow verify, oh, I have fixed the bug maybe then the, the bounty system uh, doesn't need to rely on the honor system too.